Hello, everyone. Welcome to this interview, just part of the Cambridge Church Business School video series, CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. Um, really appreciate you being here with us today. By way of introduction, my name is Mark Durant. I am a professor of organization ethnography here at Cambridge Church Business School. And I'm incredibly honored to be joined here today by Greg Nance. He did his MPhil in management here in 2011. Um, and then made a real name for himself as an ultra marathon runner and also as uh, the founder of a number of startups, um, all of which have a very strong social conscience. Um, one of the best known of these is MoneyThink. And MoneyThink was recognized by President Obama in 2012 as a champion of change, which is a particularly nice accolade to have amongst very many accolades Greg already has. Um, now, as a dedicated ultra marathon runner, so most recently, what he did is he ran across the um, entire America, took him 84 days, and he uh, completed uh, this in July, a total of 3,156 miles. And he did that in part to support a, a nationwide movement that's called the Run Far Foundation, which I believe Greg himself founded. As a way of starting, I wonder if it was, it'd be okay for you to say just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I uh, number one, I'm just really delighted and honored to be here with you today um, and sharing more of how Cambridge Judge Business School has planted just so many seeds that have uh, changed my life. And rewinding the tape to, to your question, I, uh, I grew up on a little island off the coast of Seattle where really just idyllic, uh, wonderful parents, great big sister, little brother, wonderful teachers, coaches, a great pastor. And I really felt very, very safe from a young age to go do what it is that I wanted to do and felt safe to dream and then to to dare and to to try to go make things happen and when um, you know in my case with that as my my background I was able to have all these you know really bold dreams and then to to work at it uh, I wanted to be a professional baseball player that was my first big goal um didn't happen but the beauty is from working really hard to become the best hitter the best pitcher I could be I learn how to work and I, I learn a work ethic watching mom and dad and my grandpa and how hard they worked. I then applied that to my own journey. And uh, for me, by the time I get to high school, I realized, hey, like I'm probably not going to be as good of an athlete as I was envisioning. I'm not yet a great football or basketball or baseball player, but I do love to run. And running became my way of exploring, my way of really just um, processing emotions and working through difficult problems, my best thinking. And it also was just fun because I met all these wonderful people, saw these wonderful things. And over time, uh, that little running habit paired with, um, you know, a little bit of academic work ethic uh, opened some really incredible doors. And over time, I realized and um, I loved working with people to try to solve um, big challenges. And that that really began when I was in seventh grade, so middle school where we had a challenge from our teacher, there was a lot of hunger in our community around the Thanksgiving holiday. And our goal was to fill the bus, fill a school bus full of canned food for people around the holidays that were struggling. And it was one of the most meaningful experiences of my young life. And that moment um, compounded out has, uh, has really shaped everything to follow where there are a lot of challenges in our world, of course. And uh, young people um, coming together can solve enormous challenges. And I learned that lesson as a 13-year-old. And in the years since, have been trying to apply that, get young people together, working on big challenges to create big solutions. Wow. Goodness. So when you were about 13 years old, um, you, know, you clearly were motivated to try and, and, and kind of feed people that couldn't afford to feed themselves around the holidays and so on. Um, and so ultimately, that took you to the University of Chicago, took you to the judge. And I suppose one question would be, well, what, if anything at all, did the experience here in Cambridge make, I suppose, to the journey to try and achieve social change at, at a fairly significant level? Right? Yeah, so um, the relevant context here, I, uh, I started my first um, organization almost by accident. I, I was 19. I was a college sophomore at the University of Chicago, and this was a, 
the year 2008. So there's massive financial upheaval, which we've all seen the headlines of, you know, uh, London financial markets and Wall Street getting, uh, you know, obliterated there. The thing that really hit for me was how many regular people, their lives were just turned upside down when we can't access financing or we can't stay on, on top of our mortgage or our car payments running down um, this neighborhood in Chicago just saw the challenges firsthand. And for me, um, that just, it hit very deeply that, look, there's there's a crisis here and what can we do about it? We're right here. Um, we have some spare time. We have a heart for this. What can we do? And um, those moments led to, to money thing. That's been an incredible, you know, now 14 year journey in building this. And the first three years, um, the time we, we got very lucky, the timing was so right, where everyone's concerned about financial capacity, financial literacy, that, you know, our idea you know, run by college students was able to really uh, have big wind in the sales. And we were able to grow um, relatively you know, uh, ambitiously there in the first couple of years. My admissions essay to Cambridge was all about um, I think I've gotten lucky this first time. I really want to learn the craft of entrepreneurship and I want to learn the craft of management for how do we build the best teams possible. And that was my big emphasis. And uh, Judge was absolutely amazing at that, where um, from Professor Ben Lawson, uh, an incredible human, he taught me how to ask the right questions to understand process, understand protocol. And he's a supply chain expert, which is definitely not my background. Um, but he brought the subject to life. And all of a sudden, I started seeing supply chain in everything, including how to run a two-sided marketplace or how to get young people into classrooms to share you know, their passion. Actually, you can think of that in supply chain. And you can think about it in terms of um, asking the right questions to build the right efficiencies, the right training, the right protocols to help people do their best work. And a second professor that... Uh, really influenced my thinking was uh, Manuel Ariaga, who is a big data specialist. And he actually, in his spare time, taught me how to code in Python. And learning how to code, you know, I already had a technology interest, but a uh, huge, huge, just expansive uh, toolkit that uh, all these years later uh, has been so wonderful. Um, I'm not the most proficient engineer by any stretch, but I, I absolutely like thinking about challenges and how do we architect and then build this for a, a 1x prototype and then 10, 100,000 x scale. And those conversations, understanding how to use data and how to then structure our thinking into a code base, um, immensely valuable, even if you're doing something in the low tech or no tech space. When you ran across America, right? It took you 84 days, I think, that um, you did it for foundation you started yourself, right? It's the Run Far Foundation. And as I understand it, the Run Fire Foundation uh, is dedicated to supporting youth mental health. And I wonder if you might kind of unpack this for us, you know, in terms of what motivated you to focus specifically, of all things, on, on youth mental health. Yeah, um, I appreciate that question. So when I was 16, um, you know, I'm a multi-sport athlete. I'm getting pretty good grades in school. I'm the class president by all appearances, doing pretty well um, and you know, succeeding there in American high school. And um, behind the scenes, my uh, beloved grandpa, Charlie, uh, my biggest hero, he's larger than life. He chipped rock out of uh, caves during the Great Depression to help feed his widowed mother, his little sister. He joins the Marine Corps in 1940, right before the outbreak of the war, uh, fights throughout the South Pacific, including Iwo Jima. Uh, and with only a 10th grade education, ends up becoming an executive at Western Electric, um, a big American telecom. And just incredible life journey, including becoming a dad of six, my, my father included there, and then a granddad to many, including me. And uh, the chance to learn from him was just absolutely incredible. And he came live with us and you know help raise me. And, and he was really the one adult in my life that I felt like really understood me. And um, when I'm 16, all, a lot of my life is going really, really well. One morning I wake up and Grandpa Charlie, um, something's very wrong. He's suffered a very debilitating stroke, um, so much so that physically completely diminished. And then mentally, he, he has trouble remembering who I am. And I feel completely powerless to help my Grandpa Charlie the way that he's always been there to help me. And totally overwhelming experience. It, it uh, just burned really deeply in me. And I felt, I felt terrible. I felt awful. I felt powerless and this like searing pain. 
And um, I didn't know it then, but I was experiencing pretty intense um, depression and then anxiety related to, to loss and just overwhelming grief. Like a lot of young people, I made a series of really poor choices to try to cope with that and began self-medicating with, um, with alcohol and then with painkillers. And um, only, um, you know, for, this goes on for actually several years, uh, in my case, until I'm 23 years old, and I'm able to uh, slowly move past this with um, volunteer service work, like Money Think, as I mentioned, and then with running, like a daily running habit helped me to finally work through these challenges. Um, for years out thereafter, I was embarrassed about this. I didn't want to think about depression or anxiety or alcoholism or addiction, Um only as I am uh, now have several years of perspective and I'm working on my, my debut film and we're going to be telling the story of uh, the addiction epidemic in America, only in the course of these interviews, and I do you know, dozens and dozens and then hundreds of interviews uh, for this project, I keep hearing the same thing with people who've struggled with addiction, families of those who've struggled, and it keeps coming back to mental health challenges, uh, particularly as young people, where every young person anywhere in the world goes through hard stuff. It's difficult growing up, especially when there's a global pandemic, when there's isolation, when social media magnifies all this. And throughout these conversations, I realized, look, um, it's not enough to try to just treat addiction once it's a full-blown um, disease. And once it's already you know, ravaging an individual's life, their family, their society, their community, what if we go upstream? How can we actually help people to build the resilience before they've begun self-medicating to try to make their pain feel better? And with that question in mind, um, realize, hey, uh, a nonprofit that can work directly with young people all across the country getting them active, getting them engaged, helping them build community with a purpose larger themselves is going to be a key part of this formula. And it takes a village. It's not going to, it's not going to solve the problem by itself, but it can become a, a central component in a lot of kind of underprivileged, under-accessed opportunity, um, communities like rural farmland, like reservation, like urban environments that typically don't have as many resources to combat mental health challenges. And so for me, it's a very personal mission and it also affects every community in the United States and, and around the world. And we wanna be part of the solution there as we go. Wow, thanks, Greg. I mean, goodness, I appreciate you being candid about you know, your own episode and, and how you self-medicated and, and again, help to tie it in with the work that you feel so strongly about very clearly now. And well done on the, the, the Run Far Foundation. And when you're running for 84 days, how do you stay motivated? It's a physical challenge to be sure, mm -hmm. but even more so, even more so, it's what's going on between your ears. It's the, it's the mindset, it's the mental game. And, you know, I was the Yahoo out there running. There's absolutely no way I make it without an incredible support team. And so that's the first thing. Um, I'm a big believer, best team wins. Mm -hmm. uh, learn that lesson time and again at Cambridge. And now in the years to follow, and that absolutely includes trying to run 3,000 miles across you know, North America and and waking up every morning, the hardest part. Yeah, everything is sore. There's you're feeling a lot of pain all over your body, and I've got to go run another 40 miles um, mm -hmm. with a bunch of big hills. The sun's going to be broiling me, and I got to do it. And luckily, I've got a colleague um, who understands you know a little bit of my psychology, and so he's got a breakfast plate. 10 feet out of bed, all I have to do is get up, waddle over to the desk, and I can start eating. And then I can drink a cup of coffee, which is how I start my day. Uh, and then I'm gonna get a little like a little pep up massage before we drive to the start line to begin the day's run. And so part of it is uh, building the little rituals to, uh, it's almost like a little magnet to get you out of bed and to get you motivated. Because once you've taken the first steps, everything is easier, actually. It's all about that momentum to get moving. And uh, that uh, I've learned that lesson time and again. It's taking that first leap is uh, has been the key. So, oh, so that's interesting, right? So, to what extent is is run far set up to help bid in small lit lit rituals like this with maybe kids that that suffer mental difficulties or from underprivileged areas? Because I think it's interesting, right? So the rituals do help, don't they? Um, because it, it structures the day and so on. So, to what extent is that part of the program? 
Yeah. So yeah, uh, a little bit on what we're, we're actually up to. So we've kind of two core pillars. One of them is after school running clubs for primarily rural communities, reservation, and in those urban environments I mentioned. And in these after school running clubs, it's not just you running like a track team, it's really running with a purpose as we call it. Cause you get together, you debrief your day, you share a, a win, something you're proud of, you're excited about, reasons you're hopeful and optimistic. Um, and you can share honestly about things that are challenging for you in the moment too. Um, there's a, you know, you're met with kindness and compassion as you share this you're setting goals together for things that you want to want to achieve, whether in school, with your running, with your family, with your academics. And, and then as you go out and run, and we do run, you're actually picking up litter. You're helping to restore your community's natural beauty. We have a big littering um, challenge in America. And I think it's really empowering as a young person to realize, well, like, I can help make this street and then this block and then this entire community look its best by by helping to restore it and to clean it. And each student is working toward running as a, as a capstone project, a 10K, 10 kilometers, over six miles. That's a long way to run when you're getting into running. And that's part of the beauty is it's not about how fast you go. It's about finishing a big goal, proving yourself, I can do this. And in parallel with that big run, you were also going to do a large volunteer project altogether. And so for some folks, that's painting a mural, which maybe honors your um, your tribe's history on this reservation. Or maybe it's um, planting a vegetable garden for the nursing home or for elderly or for you know, the preschool in your community, doing something nice for others is, uh, is, is the, the core emphasis of, uh, of that project. So we've got the um, the running clubs and then the second uh, pillar here is about community grants. So there's a lot of young people that have a great idea to make their community better, but may lack the financial resources to make it happen. And so we we're a micro grant maker, a hundred to five hundred dollars. And uh, you know, our very first uh, project was a five hundred dollar grant for a uh, carnival, a mental health carnival in Montana. Um, and this this community had lost several farmers to suicide as their crops are failing because of flooding and because of drought. And this young woman who'd lost her own father, she uh, puts on a carnival to get people talking, to get young people playing and to get adults connecting over their own mental health challenges to build support. So um, community grants plus running clubs. And yet ritual is, is a part of all that. We wanna have a, a nice warm up and warm down. We have a process for how we connect you to, to mentors and to support all with the aim you're not alone. You're you're connected to a community. We've got a, a big purpose. We're working together, and we need you. It takes a village. We need you to be on our team here to make it happen. And that um, that feeling, I think, gives young people a sense of purpose and a sense of resilience when the headwinds of life hit, which they will. And it's all about having the right people around when that happens. Well, it's very powerful. Thank you. Um, just building on that, Greg. Um, to what extent do you think it's true that some of the biggest successes we have as individuals or as communities are built on some of the bigger bigger tragedies of life, you know, the, mm. the, 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 the big adversities that we have to try and overcome. And the reason I ask you is because it seems to be, you know, just listening to you talk, that a lot of your own success is grounded in some ways in, in some quite difficult experiences, right? Yeah, it... Uh... I think there's a profound connection. I think um, those of us that have been so fortunate to avoid um, tragedy or avoid deep pain, um, it can be difficult to summon that extra reserve of strength or courage. If our life has been so easy, it's, it's natural for almost a complacency to follow. Um, and those of us that have been rocked by life and you know the challenges, um, and the vicissitudes of of these difficulties, um, I think there's a there's a wellspring of courage within each of us, and it takes those experiences to find it. And then in those really dark moments, um, that's where I think a lot of reflection and kind of hand wringing, soul searching, can really take place. That leads to um, the reflective clarity that comes from those dark chapters. Where I know my own experience, I each of the companies I've um, launched literally every one of them has been on the backside of really difficult circumstances and really difficult challenges that forced me to think about my why and forced me to think about 
what really matters to me? How do I want to measure you know, my life? What do I want? How do I want to spend these precious days I have on the earth? Um, we don't typically ask those questions when everything's going well, um, at least in my case. It's, it's really been in those difficult chapters, those difficult seasons. And for me, clarity is is king. Like if you have a sense of purpose and direction, you're uh, far more likely to go achieve something and to, to go build something than if you're just being whipped in the wind. And um, that has happened in those challenging moments. So yeah, I think there is a, a powerful connection. Each of us handle it differently, but that's been a guiding light in my own journey. So, so you know, when you look at the kids that you help support, um, you know, that may themselves come out of quite difficult environments. It sounds like you're providing with a bit of structure. Mm -hmm. Those rituals we talked about before, um, you're providing with a purpose, which is also a structuring effect. Given all the publicity that money think has received, can you tell us a little bit about what this that money think does? Yeah, money think helps young people navigate the most leveraged financial decisions in their life, which for a lot of young people is around higher education and the college choice. So our mobile app, you can take a picture of your college acceptance letter and your financial aid, and it's a real time, true cost of college calculator. So in real time, you figure out how much this, this can cost and whether given your situation, that's affordable or if you should actually look elsewhere. And so we help you compare apples to apples to apples, each of the opportunities in front of you. So that way you and your family make the right choice for you and you can graduate with less debt and a degree. Our goal is to help uh, 1 million students avoid $10 billion in student loan debt by 2025. So is there something that you're burning to do in the same social enterprise scope mm. that you haven't yet done? Yeah, I uh, number one, I feel like the luckiest guy. Um, I work with amazing people in each of these organizations, and you know, I, I may um, be the guy with the big title, but I without our teams, none of this is possible. None of this happens, and um, I have a couple of strengths, but I have lots and lots of weaknesses that. Luckily, I have superstar colleagues that that mask those weaknesses. We're able to do some really good work. So uh, I, I want that to be clear from the jump. Um, and as other uh, leaders listening in, um, I think we all um, recognize that and can inventory some of our strengths and um, find great folks to then help supplement and build it out. Um, for me, to your, to your actual question, um, I, I keep coming back to the core of how do we empower, um, particularly young people, that's my, my passion, to make the most of the opportunities in front of them, because um, you know we we talk about the American dream here in the United States, and I, I'm a believer that the American dream right now is endangered. Um, we have our housing costs are out of control, our healthcare costs are out of control. We have uh, a mental health and addiction epidemic that's roiling our country, roiling young people. That a lot of our our leaders don't have even the courage to talk about, let alone to build real policy around. And so I'm a more and more, I'm thinking about how do we create more leverage to help more people. Um, and until folks have housing and healthcare, um, it's really, really hard to think expansively about your potential and to go be the best version of you you can be when you're um, you feel stuck and you feel like no matter how hard I work, I can never get ahead. Um, and the real magic of I think the the American uh, dream has been. If you work hard, you will get ahead. You will find a way, and we've we've lost um, we've lost elements of that. And so I think that that was part of my purpose with with Money Think. Um, that's part of the purpose with uh, Dyad Mentorship and with Run Far Foundation, trying to help folks build the right foundation, really understand their choices and opportunities, and then give them the tools, the guidance, the mentorship to make the most and to, to find the right path for them. And um, I'm realizing more and more that maybe the missing piece is less an, another NGO, and it's more um, the, really the levers of policy um, and really creating um, the right framework, both kind of uh, legally, um, regulatorily, and then also at a budgetary perspective so that young people have a fighting chance. Because um, across the world, young people have energy. They want to work. They want to hustle. And uh, you want to create a structure that rewards that and that um, enables you to be um, you know, rewarded for that heart and hustle you're putting in. And so that's one place I've been uh, called to in this season is to better understand um, those policy choices and then hopefully contribute some perspective as an operator on the ground trying to do good work. Here are the headwinds we face, the students face, 
let's uh, let's streamline this so that we can do our work and help more folks. So that's interesting, right? So, so how receptive um, are policymakers to to your ideas? Um, so aside from the kind of support it might give you in the media, you know, um, how much actual listening do you see, and how much appetite is there for change in an environment? which at least for those of us outside of America looks more divided, I suppose, than, than ever before. Yeah, well, well, on that front, so we are deeply divided right now in the United States. It's, it's a lot of like, what cable news do you watch? Do you watch Fox? Are you conservative? Do you watch CNN or MSNBC if you're on the left? And um, the, my favorite part about the run um, was when you're actually out there running through communities that may have very little in common with you politically, it doesn't matter. You can actually connect. You can build a real human relationship. And no one's asking you whether you voted for Biden or Trump. It's all about, you know, where are you from? What are you up to? Wow. Uh, and as soon as I mention our mission is youth mental health, there is a really powerful universal connectivity there that uh, that forms. And I'll, I'll tell a very quick story that uh, may be my favorite from the run. I am in farmland, Ohio, middle of nowhere. Um, there's cornfields in all directions. There's no people as far as my eye can see. And out of the corner of my eye, as I'm hobbling down this road, my ankle's on fire. I look out, there's a car and it's a police cruiser. And this police officer is not happy to see me. In fact, he, he demands I stop. Whoa, like I'm not, I'm not used to being stopped by the police. Okay, like what's happening here? They, there's been a call for a suspicious person. And it's very, it's evident very quickly. Um, he believes I am a fentanyl dealer. Um, fentanyl is this awful, awful narcotic that's killing a lot of kids in America right now. Um, and he wants to see my license. He wants to see my registration and what I'm doing. Uh, I'm running. Yeah, I'm literally running across the country. My support vehicle is probably 50 miles ahead getting me lunch right now. Like I, I, I'm not a drug dealer. Um, and an amazing thing happens where slowly, you know, I'm able to show them, here's this article about us in Pittsburgh a couple of days ago. Here's my website. Here's this picture of me on this running website. Like, okay, fine. I'm starting to believe you. And over the course of the next hour, a couple of things become clear. Number one, this sheriff is absolutely going to vote differently than me at the upcoming election in November. He's on the other side of the political aisle. And number two, he cares so deeply about the kids in his community. He, he views himself as a father figure for all these kids. And more than anything, he wants the right thing for these kids. He wants to protect them, um, help keep them safe. And so do I. And over the next hour, um, really a deep human connection with the sheriff there, where at the end of it, I give him a purple uh, Run Far Foundation little uh, bracelet um, deal. And I tell him, hey, it's, it symbolizes, you know, it's, it's all about youth mental health. And he, he tells me, I'm not much of a jewelry guy, but I'll hang it in the cruiser. That's cool. <laughs> Powerful moment where he, you know, he's going to vote differently, and yet we're on the same team. And th that really gets me thinking, that, look, um, we're talking past each other in America. And I think that's true of a lot of um, you know, democracies today. We need to continually find common ground. And luckily, there are a lot of issues that we do see eye to eye on, regardless of what the cable news pundits are trying to tell us. And youth mental health is, is absolutely one of those. And so I, uh, I'm getting myself more uh, plugged in. You know, yesterday, I, I connected with a, a state representative, which is like a congressman, but for your state. And we had a great conversation about how do we better support young people who are not on the college track? Because if you're, if you're a really good young scholar and you know, you're thinking about places like Cambridge, you know, good for you. Our system rewards you. You have a 4.0. You've got you know, all these awards and accolades. How about the kid who doesn't enjoy reading Shakespeare, isn't really hacking the math or the science, but has a talent with their hands and they want to be a mechanic or they want to be a welder or an electrician or an installer? Our system in America, at least, does not do a good job with these young people. And uh, your mental health suffers dramatically when you're told over and over again, you're not smart, like you're not good enough. Uh, it's hard enough when you are told you're really smart, you are good enough. I, I only imagine um, how that other person feels. And um, luckily, this state representative who does have some, you know, he helps control a budget, he is actively thinking about that and wanted advice for like, what are the mental health ramifications? So a number of our leaders are asking the right questions, and it's heartening to hear that. Um, and I think we need more thoughtful people in public service, you know, the Western world over, because there are, you know, fundamental challenges right now to the democratic order. Um, and we need 
responsive leadership to, to build those policies. And um, we, ha we don't have enough of that uh, in America, certainly, and we, we need more of it. If you don't mind, I'd love to go back just very briefly to the physical challenges. So we've talked a little bit about the kind of the entrepreneurial, the social mm -hmm. entrepreneurial challenges, which is hugely significant in your, in your case. Is there a physical challenge that you're itching, mm -hmm. itching to engage with? Because uh, you've done a lot, right? It's the, the world marathon. Um, you know, you've done the running across America. You know, what's left? Yeah, so I, uh, the fun part about this is, uh, you know, in any pursuit, there are, there are levels, right? Where when I first started running, I did the quarter mile, one lap around the track. And so one mile felt, no, that's just not me. That's way too far. Um, the idea of running a 5K, mm, no way. Are you crazy? And over time, your perspective shifts as you as you keep going. And I feel like I'm in that place with running now where I um, I love running. It makes me really happy. It helps me keep my mental health in check and on track. And it uh, it's just a wonderful way to explore and connect with folks. The same things I felt as a kid, I'm experiencing again. Um, the challenge, the next challenge for me, um, so I ran from the Atlantic to the Pacific um, mm -hmm. over 84 days. And I want to see how fast I can run from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, but instead across the North American continent, I'm going to do the um, the isthmus of uh of Central America. So actually, I'm going to be in Panama, uh, starting with a foot in the Atlantic, uh, right next to the Panama Canal, running as quickly as possible to the Pacific, following um, a couple routes um, and little roads and pathway next to the canal. The time to beat is 11 hours, eight minutes to cover that near 60 miles. So got to be putting down some pace. Um, got to handle the heat and the humidity. Um, and unlike the run across America, where it was all about pacing yourself really gently, for tomorrow, this will be one of those all out, leave everything on the course. And I haven't done uh, a run like this in, um, you know, since, uh, since the spring. And so it's going to be um, a fresh challenge and one that um, I would love to walk away from that with, uh, with a great adventure, a great experience. And if all clicks together, right, a, uh, a new running record too. Wow. Got to keep us posted on that. That sounds good. Um, here's an anecdote and you'll just have to confirm whether it's true or false but i'm told that when you were in cambridge you applied to do what you thought was a 5k run <laughs> only to find out as you turned up on the starting line it's actually 50k <laughs> i yeah i was i was once uh even younger and more foolish than i am today um yeah i uh i had just an incredible experience at cambridge as a i was on the boxing team um, with a number of classmates actually from Judge, and we loved training. The bummer about participating so deeply in boxing was we didn't have as much time as we would have liked to go explore more of the UK. And so um, a couple of these mates would go on like little pub crawls around um, the country. I love running. I wanted to go have this adventure. So yeah, I, I thought I was signing up for something far more leisurely and enjoyable than what I ended up signing up for. But that's the beauty of life is you show up, uh, you realize, whoa, like, what did, I, what have I signed up for? My goodness. And then you take the leap and then amazing things happen. And so that, that's exactly how that played out on the Jurassic coast. It was a miserable day getting rained on. I was freezing, but it ended up being, um, absolutely positively life affirming and life changing. And that's the beauty of putting yourself out there, um, signing on for challenges that feel way, way too big for you. You can grow to become the person that achieves things like that. And that's true of not only running, but literally any domain of life. Keep showing up, take the leap and great things happen. I love that bit of advice actually, just show up, you know, um, and, and just go and do it. And um, I wonder if you had any more bits of advice. So as we kind of close this off, you know, is there a final thought, a bit of advice, whatever it might be that you'd like to leave us, uh, leave us with? Yeah, so... A number of folks have asked me, how is it possible to run across the country or how do you launch you know, your own nonprofit? And, and the, uh, the mantra that I've come to, uh, to tell myself literally every day, eat the elephant one bite at a time. Yeah. Um, you don't always have to have every answer figured out. In fact, you shouldn't, but you can absolutely get started with the next bite, the next move in front of you. And bit by bit by bit, you eat that elephant. And whether it's running across the continent building an organization, earning that promotion, starting that company, getting funded, whatever, eat the elephant one bite at a time. Thank you, Greg. I I, uh, I remember hearing a story once of someone who actually did this with his old VW, Beetle. Mm -hmm. he, he ground it up bit by bit. 
Wow. Primitive breakfast. And he actually, it is, it's a man in this case. And he ate his, his way through the entire vehicle. Yeah. So. Wow. Finally, someone crazier than me. Nice. <laughs> Listen, Greg, thank you. Uh, it's, it's been amazing. You know, it's, it's lovely to have you here for you to show up, wake up early um, to join us. Um, your achievements are second to none, you know, and I think it, it is usually inspiring. And to pair that those physical achievements with you reaching out to try and help kids, you know, um, and being willing to be so candid about your own mental struggles and your own addiction, um, you know, we couldn't ask for more. So thank you. Um, thank you also to all of you watching. Um, this has been a video in the series of the CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. And again, I can't think of anyone better to have had a chance to interview Greg than you. So thank you. Thank you. So appreciate it, Mark. Thank you. And thank you to everyone. Much appreciated.